Amy. Hey, everybody. Uh, hope everybody's doing well. Um, it's nice to be back in your living rooms and your homes today. So we're going to talk about a topic that's pretty cool. It's actually called autophagy. I say that 10 times fast. And we're going to talk about intermittent fasting because they are related. So has anybody on the call ever done intermittent fasting? Maybe you might want to just kind of raise your hand in the chat or raise your hand or, <laughs> or nod your head. Okay, well, I wanted to talk about intermittent fasting because it seems like it's kind of faddish, you know, how we here in the United States like to go through all these fad diets. Um, and is intermittent fasting actually a fad diet or is it a clinical diet? It's actually, uh, I'll, I'll give you my opinion as we get into the presentation. So we're going to talk about intermittent fasting and see if that's something that would actually fit your lifestyle. Definitely define autophagy and see what the heck is that word? And um, is it actually related to our health? And it actually is. What are the physiological benefits? So we'll talk about that. There are certain challenges um, to following intermittent fasting. It's not as easy and there are many different protocols. So I'm going to go through what those protocols are because I do have a lot of clients and patients that say they want to start intermittent fasting. Um, and then I'll say, well, which eating pattern? And they look at me with a blank stare like, oh, I didn't know there was more than one. Um, so if you wanted to get started, I'm, I'm going to give you some tips. Of course, I always start with this slide. This It's getting a little dated now. I'm trying to look for an updated um, graph of this, but unfortunately, there's no published updated graph of this yet, but it's just an indication to show that we are just a dieting society. We really are. And now with COVID, I got to tell you, a lot of my patients and clients have gained a lot of weight over the year um, with the shutdown, the quarantine, the you know change in lifestyle. So I'm sure this, this chart would be um, pretty much changed, uh, not really for the better too. Most of us um, try to tackle exercise and eating less as the first two things that we do to try to um, get into a healthy lifestyle. And intermittent fasting can actually fit into this because it's meant to reduce calories. Um, and that's how we can actually eat less. So let's talk about this fasting. So there are many different protocols of fasting. First of all, there's religious fasting. So some of us um, do fast during religious times. Um, but this type of fasting that I'm talking about is a deliberate fasting um, meant to um, change your dietary lifestyle. Although there is no standardized definition. It basically involves some sort of time restricted eating pattern. So it's not a diet per se, it's an eating pattern. And there are many different protocols. So you have to see what kind of fits into your lifestyle. I'm going to show you which one I actually used. Uh, weight loss is the primary goal of following intermittent fasting, although there's a lot of research to support how intermittent fasting can also help with health, like um, to help reduce some diabetes episodes and insulin resistance and some other things that we're going to get into. Unfortunately, there are still some risks of intermittent fasting, like dehydration is always one of the risks. And people that follow intermittent fasting may or may not get into something called ketosis. Ketosis means that your body is changing to a different alternative energy source, where it's actually tapping into your fat tissue. The problem with that is that your brain doesn't really like it. It's like a backup system. Your brain likes glucose, but we have that backup system, which is the ketosis and the ketone bodies. Um, but a lot of times when you go under ketosis, you don't feel so great. And that's why even people that start the keto diet, they almost feel like sluggish, almost like you have a fishbowl over your head. And that would actually be ketosis. So some of the health claims for intermittent fasting would be weight loss, like we said, but also reducing inflammation. And as you know, and we've had lectures on this before, the primary cause of many conditions and disease is an inflammatory process, which is a physiological response where your body is secreting cytokines and all of these you know, chemicals that actually uh, cause us to become inflamed. And this inflammatory process is what causes changes in the way we use glucose and insulin, and it can cause issues. Um, intermittent fasting has also been touted to improve cardiovascular profile, especially with the lipid profile, your cholesterol, your HDL, your LDL. Um, some endocrinologists that I know actually use intermittent fasting to treat 
pre-diabetes. Now, pre-diabetes really doesn't have an official definition either, um, but pre-diabetes means that somebody is not diagnosed as having diabetes, but they are already having some issue, issues with their insulin. They become insulin resistant, which means that if you go and you get your lab work done, your glucose levels might be high um, and your A1C might be abnormal, but not to the range where it's diagnosed as diabetes. So that's pre-diabetes. And it's amazing how many millions of Americans actually fall under pre-diabetes. Intermittent fasting is supposed to also help with the um, diabetic profile as well. It's supposed to help lower blood pressure and of course improve our body composition. And intermittent fasting is directly related to inducing this autophagy. <laughs> and I know I'm gonna screw up uh, pronouncing that by the end of this lecture. All right, so let's go through some of these intermittent fasting protocols. So when I ask my patient or my client, okay, you wanna start intermittent fasting, what protocol do you wanna follow? So I have to explain what they are to see what we can do to implement it into their lifestyle. So one protocol is you alternate, you fat, you alternate fasting. So it's every other day. So you rotate a fasting day with an eating day. And on the fasting day, it's not that you're not eating anything. You're just reducing your calories very substantially, um, probably by, by about 50 to 75%. So you are actually having calorie reduction on those fasting days. And it almost reminds me of uh, carb loading a little bit or carb cycling. Uh, carb cycling is a type of eating pattern where one day you're going really high with carbs. It's almost like you're carb loading, especially if you're gonna do some sort of competition or have some sort of aerobic activity. And then other days you go really, really low with carbs, you know, like 30 to 50 grams. So it kind of reminds me of that. So this, this, I think what's one of the pros of the alternate day fasting is that you don't get that fatigue from fasting. You know, fasting really, you know, we don't like to fast, we like to eat. So it really gets very exhausting to fast. So I see that with alternate day fasting, I'm not really seeing that fatigue. Um, but it is, kind of hard to follow just because fasting is hard anyway. And on days that we're not fasting, are we actually binge eating? So we have to be careful with that. Um, there are other intermittent fasting protocols that are more commonly known, and those are the time restricted plans. Um, that means like you might have a 16-8, an 18-6, or a 24. And what that means is that 16 hours off of eating and eight hours on of eating or 18 hours off and six hours on, or 20 hours off and only four hours of eating. So you kind of have to see what, if that actually works for you. So I do have some clients that are following the 16-8 and they might start eating at 12 at noon or maybe even 1 p.m. And then they end at, well, go eight hours later. They, they end in the early evening and then stop. And when you think about it, when we sleep, we're fasting, right? So if you go to bed early and you wake up a little bit later, well, all of that time is fasting. And that's the best way to fast because you're sleeping. Um, and it also negates that common um, phrase that we would always say, like breakfast is the most important meal of the day, because with intermittent fasting protocols, you're not eating breakfast, you're actually eating later. I'm gonna show you a case study of one of my patients that actually followed this time restricted um, eating pattern that actually really worked for him pretty well. Then there's the modified fast. And this is actually a fasting that I did. Um, and you only do it twice per week. And what you do is on two days of the week, but not consecutively, you reduce your calories very substantially, maybe 400 to 700 calories. So I, I kept myself on a 700 calorie diet just for two days. And then um, for the rest of the week, the five days, I would go back up to my usual calorie intake, which is about 1200 calories. And what I find is that for me, that was a really easy protocol for me, just because 
it's easy for me to fast, but I think that's also related to my eating disorder. So I have to be really careful because I was anorexic when I was growing up. So I become very restrictive with eating. And that's one of the controversies with intermittent fasting is it actually inducing an eating disorder. So you have to be careful with it. That's why, you know, I only do it for two days. But what it did do was confuse my physiology a little bit. So I was almost able to get off my weight loss plateau because I was trying to lose some weight and I was on a plateau and I was exercising like crazy and I just couldn't break that plateau. And this actually enabled me to drop that extra couple of pounds that I needed to lose. I don't do it all the time. I do it, you know, a couple of times a year um, or whenever I feel like, all right, I need to lose some weight and I want to try and confuse my body a little bit. So, but it, it, it was easy for me, but doing 500 calories a day for a lot of people isn't that easy. And then there's a weekly one day fasting where you just pick one day of the week. And this one is actually very dramatic because you are actually fasting. <laughs> you're having some water. That's what you're doing. So you're really not eating. It just kind of reminds me of like when you're getting ready for a colonoscopy or for a surgery, you're just not allowed to eat anything. You can only have clear liquids that are sugar free. You know, um, that's not exciting either, but it is a type of fasting. And then there's the 10 day juice fast, which I don't really recommend. Um, it's just drinking fruit juices and broths. The problem with a lot of these fruit juices is that again, you're having a lot of sugar. Some people get diarrhea from it. Um, it it's, I don't even see it as nutritionally sound. I would rather just have one day of just having, you know, resting your bowels, resting your stomach, having water, having broth, but the 10 day juice fast, I just didn't see any benefit in that, honestly. So just to recap on these different protocols, most of my patients are doing a time restricted protocol. They're picking, mo the most common is a 16, eight. That's the most common. So 16 hours off, eight hours on. And then um, a lot of my patients are also doing the modified fast. So they're taking two days of the week and they're just going a really, really low calorie. So what are the benefits? Well, the benefits is energy restriction. And the whole point of autophagy to help our health and get our insulin levels back to normal and our blood pressure back to normal is to actually reduce calories. Um, what I like about intermittent fasting as well is it almost eliminates that diet fatigue. You know, a lot of nutritionists are saying, look, you need to eat, you know, regular calories every single day and track your intake and do my fitness pal and la la la. That's very fatiguing for a lot of people, myself included. I mean, here I am telling my patients, you need to track your intake and I do it too, but I get bored. I get tired of doing it. Um, so, you know, my clients and patients get tired of doing it too. With intermittent fasting, you're not really getting bored of it because, you know, it's kind of exciting and different every day. And it really is an easy eating pattern to follow, especially for people that aren't breakfast eaters. I have a lot of people that they just, you know, they don't eat breakfast or I have um, patients that travel a lot. So they have to catch flights. So they're not going to eat a breakfast before they go on a plane and things like that. Um, some of the challenges, though, is that intermittent fasting doesn't necessarily mean you're eating the right stuff. So if you're 16 hours off and eight hours on, but you're eating hot fudge sundaes and fried chicken, well, you're kind of defeating the purpose, right? So during those eight hours, you want to eat healthfully. So you want to have your lean proteins and your fruits and your vegetables. And the goal is to still have calorie restriction. So it doesn't mean that you're gorging yourself during this eight hours. So the one good thing that I do find is that people that follow intermittent fasting actually feel less hungry. So you think that they would feel more hungry, but they're not. They're actually feeling less hungry. Um, sometimes I do see a protein malnutrition because they're just not getting enough of their lean proteins. Um, sometimes it could lead to vitamin and mineral, mineral deficiencies as well. Dehydration is always a big thing. I always worry about that. And then those people that are actually being treated for diabetes and they're on insulin or any kind of, you know, glipizide or metformin and things like that, you have to make sure you talk to your endocrinologist to say, look, I want to change my eating pattern because insulin is designed around your eating. So if you're really restricting yourself for many hours of the day, you really have to change those dosages and you don't want to self-medicate. So you have to talk to your endocrinologist about it. Um, 
there are certain groups that I don't recommend following intermittent fasting, like my pregnant ladies, that's always a very sensitive thing, um, or even if they're lactating as well. Intermittent fasting is not appropriate for children. Um, and the elderly have to be careful because you want to make sure that if you're kind of reducing how many hours you're eating in the day that you're still getting proper nourishment. Okay. Um, intermittent fasting is actually not endorsed by the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. The Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics is my professional oversight. So it's not something that I promote, but if a patient or client comes to me and says, look, I want to follow it, I give them assistance because if I don't, I know the patient is going to follow it anyway, and I want them to follow it the right way. All right, so what is autophagy? Well, when you look at the actual medical word, auto means self and phagy means eat. <laughs> so it is a form of self-eating. It's a natural process where the cells in our body actually kind of scavenge around and they will degrade or actually kill cells or components. It's, it's a type of regeneration. Um, we also have stop measures as well. So if our cells are replicating, you know, because we need to replicate ourselves. If the body notices that that cell is off or mutated, it actually kills it. So that's a type of autophagy as well. So it is a natural process. Um, it's to help homeostasis, which is a balance, but it's also a way that our body can reduce free radicals and kind of conserve energy as well. And it's a pretty cool concept. I just put this picture here. It kind of reminds me of Pac-Man a little bit, autophagy, because you have, this is the cell, and you've got an autophagosome, which is responsible for the autophagy. And it kind of finds different parts of the cell that it doesn't like, and it engulfs it, and then it attaches to something called a lysosome. And a lysosome actually secretes chemicals that actually destroy the cell. So I know that's just very simplistic. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty complicated, actually. But basically, what it is, is that the cells are taken care of, your body's taking care of itself. It's getting rid of old parts, and it's killing stuff that it doesn't need. And it's allowing for reduction of free radicals and also um, cons conservation of energy as well. And there are all different types of autophagy that we're not going to get into because this is totally biochemistry. There are a number of factors that influence autophagy, of course, nutrition, which I'm going to show you in a minute, stress, infection, oxygen levels, cell density. So certain things um, speed it up and certain things decrease it. Now we want to actually increase it. That's what's actually going to help our health. As a matter of fact, autophagy has been shown to reduce our risk of cancer. And I'm going to go through this a little bit more, um, boost our innate immune system. Our innate immune system is that which protects protects us from all these creepy crawlies in the environment. It, it's shown to reduce cardiomyopathy. Cardiomyopathy is a fancy word that means disease of the heart muscle. It helps to slow down the aging process. <laughs> That's always a good thing. Helps to reduce infectious diseases, helps to reduce fatty liver. It helps to reduce the risk of type 2 diabetes and also helps to reduce neurodegenerative diseases like osteoarthritis, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, things like that. So the relationship between intermittent fasting and autophagy is that if we're eating less calories through the eating pattern of intermittent fasting, that actually triggers autophagy. And that's a good thing because what triggers it is insulin and glucose. That's what really triggers it. So animal studies have shown evidence of autophagy after 24 hours of fasting, and then it peaks around 48 hours of fasting. The other thing is if we eat less, we have less calories, it also positively influences the gut microbiota. And I know we had a lecture on that before, but if we can change the gut, where the good bacteria is just predominant over the bad bacteria, that's just going to confer health. And there's just a lot of research on that. And I remember seeing a commercial way back when, I think it was in the 80s or the 90s, it was um, a commercial of a gentleman that was, I think he was like over 100 years old. And I think it was a yogurt commercial. I think that's what it was. But it was also research that showed um, that when you really, really restrict your calories, even in animals, 
um, you're going to live longer. And that's why obesity and overweight is such a killer in so many different ways. So the on and off switch of autophagy is when you eat too much, you're going to induce insulin. Now, remember, insulin is that hormone that's secreted by the pancreas that is supposed to help regulate your blood glucose. Your blood glucose always has to be at a certain level because that's what gives us energy to live. It makes, you know, allows our heart to pump and our brain to function. So it always has to be in a certain range. That's why when we have diabetes, that blood sugar goes too high because we have a defect in the insulin and that is what causes problems. Now you could have microvascular diseases, renal disease, heart disease, et cetera, et cetera. So when you eat less, it actually lowers the amount of insulin that's being secreted. That kind of makes sense, right? Because you still have to regulate your blood sugar, but you're going to surge insulin less. So it's shown in humans that you need to be fasting for at least eight hours and actually 16 to 18 hours is really desirable. And if you're, you're able to do it 24 to 48 hours, that's even better. The problem is, is if you go over that, it starts to have the opposite effect. Okay. Not just because of dehydration, but you can actually start breaking down muscle mass. Okay. So I'm not promoting days and days of starvation. It's, it needs to be a short window, but it seems that autophagy seems to be um, really instigated within that 16 to 18 hour fast. So just like I said, how does it actually protect us? Well, fasting and autophagy can protect against neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And how does it do that? It helps the brain cells to, to excrete toxic proteins. It's the beta amyloids that actually create these plaques in our brain. And that's what we think leads to Alzheimer's disease. So if we can reduce the production of that, you're going to reduce your risk of Alzheimer's. And if you really want to reduce Alzheimer's, follow the intermittent fasting eating pattern, but eat the mind diet. Remember, we had a lecture on the mind diet, which is the Mediterranean slash dash diet. So the foods that you're choosing would be the Mediterranean like foods, right? So you're going to do your lean proteins and plant based, basically. So you can have your fruits, your vegetables, your whole grains. So that would be like a triple whammy. So that would really, really protect you. So how does autophagy and intermittent fasting protect us against cancer? Well, autophagy repairs damaged proteins that contribute to tumor formation. Now, what is cancer? Cancer are rogue cells. They're just crazy. They have a life of their own. As a matter of fact, cells, when they reproduce, normal cells, when they reproduce, they will regenerate. But when they touch each other, they stop growing. Whereas cancer cells, no, they keep growing and growing. As a matter of fact, they jump over each other, they go into your bloodstream and they start to metastasize. So cancer is just crazy. It's really uh, an, an amazing physiological anomaly. But autophagy can actually repair damaged proteins to reduce the risk of creating these cancer proteins. So that's always good. Autophagy and intermittent fasting um, helps insulin resistance by protecting the beta cells. The beta cells are those cells in the pancreas that secrete insulin. So if you can protect them and allow them to function appropriately and not, not allow them to wear out, then perhaps our insulin levels can be secreted at a normal level, and that would be good. Um, scientists have also found that autophagy also maintains and protects muscle tissue. And that kind of makes sense too, because when you look at, um, you know, uh, free radicals, when you look at damaging things in the environment, when you look at obesity, when you look at the inflammatory process, when you look at the release of stress hormones, all of that breaks down muscle. So that's something we always have to be careful about because we're naturally going to lose muscle as it is because of the aging process. So if there's a way that we can actually protect it and also induce building up lean body mass, especially with our exercise and eating lean proteins, but staying low calorie, that seems to be a winning formula. Autophagy also protects our bones. It can counteract bone loss by recycling dysfunctional bone cells. And that's good. Our bones actually go through restructuring almost every day. 
what happens is our body has to have a certain amount of calcium in our blood. So that's why when you get your lab test and the doctor is looking at the metabolic profile and your calcium is listed there and it looks normal, everybody gets excited. The only problem is that doesn't really tell me if you're grabbing calcium from your bones because calcium is not just needed for strong bones and teeth. Calcium is needed by every single muscle contraction and every single nerve transmission and blood clotting. So the nutrient calcium is extremely important for the human body. So if you're not getting enough calcium, either through dairy or non-dairy or fortified foods or your yogurt and things like that, your body's going to pull it and it pulls it from your bones. And then that's why we end up with osteopenia and osteoporosis, which of course can be a pretty deadly thing as we get older. So autophagy, not eating too much, can actually protect our bones by recycling the bad stuff and having our body induce the production of good stuff. So that would mean that during that intermittent fasting, again, when you're thinking about what kinds of foods you should be eating, it should be nourishing foods. So you want to still have your calcium foods, you know, your folate foods, your B12 foods, your lean proteins, you know, so it, it doesn't mean, you know, have a free for all. Autophagy and intermittent fasting can also help our heart health by renewing damaged proteins and organelles in the heart cell. Now, what's really fascinating about cardiac tissue is that if you damage heart cells or cardiac cells, they don't regenerate. So it's not like your skin. Like if you get a cut, you're going to regenerate. So that's why the cut goes away. And maybe you'll have a scar and maybe you won't have a scar. But if you damage your heart muscle, those cells don't regenerate. It's the same thing with your brain. You damage your brain, those cells don't regenerate. You damage your spinal cord, they don't regenerate. Okay, so there are certain parts of the body that don't regenerate. So that means the cells you do have, you wanna do some house cleaning and you wanna make sure they're in tip top shape and nice and healthy. Eating less with autophagy will actually help keep those cells functioning and healthy. So how do we induce this autophagy? Well, fasting. Fasting will do it. Fasting with lower calorie intake, okay? Um, I saw some research to show that even following the keto diet actually helps to induce autophagy. Now, I'm not a big promoter of the keto diet yet, although there is some research going into some of the benefits of the keto diet. What we do know about the keto diet is it does help to lower insulin. So if you are lowering insulin, that in and of itself is a good thing. I think with the keto diet, though, the issue is, is that a long-term diet plan? And that's where some of the controversy is. Maybe the keto diet could be good as a startup diet, and then maybe easing into a Mediterranean diet, okay, or a heart-healthy diet. Um, regular and intense exercise also helps to induce that autophagy, which is really almost an oxymoron because exercise actually causes free radicals. <laughs> so it's almost like we still have this built up protection mechanism. So we are supposed to exercise, okay? So it induces free radicals, but it also induces autophagy as well. Now, what's really nice is that there are some foods that can induce autophagy. And of course, that's what I'm all about, eating foods. So, you know, I don't know, as a nutritionist, I just, I have to look at food in different ways. I don't just look at it as, oh, that's an enjoyable dinner. I have to say, oh, am I getting bang for my buck? And am I getting a lot of nutrients that I need? Um, so I really like to choose foods that have multi-purpose. So black tea, coffee, blueberries, especially wild blueberries, um, cacao and dark chocolate, um, cinnamon, uh, bergamot, green tea, MCT stands for medium chain triglyceride oils, coconut, which is also found in coconut oil, olive oil, pomegranates, um, peanuts, red grapes, red wine, turmeric, and curry powder. So these are the ones that can induce autophagy. There are probably so many more foods, but these are some foods that have been studied to induce this. So I'm going to go into that a little bit more. So let's do coffee first. You know, coffee is still the number one beverage in the United States, right? So both caffeinated and decaffeinated coffee does activate autophagy in muscle tissue, liver, heart, and other vital organs 
but that research was done in mice. <laughs> so does it actually work in humans too? That, that research is kind of, we're not sure yet. We do know that there are benefits of coffee. Now, remember, coffee comes from a plant. So of course, it's going to be good for us. The problem is some of us drink too much of it. Remember, I, I think the research had shown that as long as you're keeping your coffee to no more than eight cups per day, then you're still going to reap the benefits of coffee. Once you go over that, it can actually cause issues. The other thing you have to remember is that if you have any existing issues, like with blood pressure, GERD, esophageal reflux disease, um, heart disease, you have to be careful with caffeine. Okay, so in certain cases, yeah, you still have to be careful, you know, the, the benefits won't outweigh the harmfulness if you have some of these conditions. Now, red wine, you know, I'm not a big proponent of alcohol just because I've seen alcohol hurt so many more of my patients than help them. But there is something in red wine that we know helps our heart. It's called resveratrol. And cardiologists really like red wine. And sometimes they're saying, you know, have your glass of red wine because of that polyphenol. It, it helps to protect your heart by elevating the HDL, which is the good cholesterol. And that's what helps your heart. But we're also finding that resveratrol also induces that autophagy as well. So if you are going to drink, you might as well, again, get bang for your buck, do the white wine, have one five ounce glass of red wine if you're a lady. And if you're a guy on the call here, you can have two glasses of five ounce, five ounces. And what's interesting is that, you know, red wine is actually part of a Mediterranean diet as well. And Mediterranean diet is considered one of the healthiest diets. Now, green tea is really amazing. What's really fun about green tea is that although it does have caffeine, it has another component in it that kind of counteracts the negative of the caffeine. So if you're at you know, the top level of how much caffeine you're supposed to have for the day, you can still have some green tea. It's full of bioactive polyphenols. Polyphenols are these biologically active components that actually confer health. And green tea has um, over 4,000 different active components. It's just really, it's such a healthy, healthy beverage for us. Um, and I think we had another lecture where I was talking about the uh, mate, uh, green tea mate, which is really, really good. Um, the primary catechin, it's called EGCG, um, in green tea can help combat insulin-induced aging effects, type 2 diabetes, fatty liver, and lung cancer. And what's nice about green tea is you, if you don't like to drink it, you can actually cook with it as well. You know, you can put it in, in your different stews and soups. You can actually coat fish and meat with it. So you can make ice cream out of it. <laughs> so there are different um, things that you can do with green tea. And what's nice about green tea, too, is that you can either make it strong if you like it strong. I like it really strong. Mine almost looks like sludge, seriously. Um, but if you don't like it that strong, just make it a little weaker. You're still going to have some benefits from it. Now, olive oil, we know that olive oil is healthy for us. It's heart healthy. You know, it's really promoted in the American Heart Association diet, Mediterranean diet. But it also helps to induce that autophagy as well. Okay, so again, autophagy means that your body is kind of regenerating cells, it's getting rid of old parts. And, you know, whatever we can do to do that is a good thing. Just remember, though, that oil is still oil. So in terms of calories, just because you're picking a good oil doesn't mean you go crazy with it. One tablespoon of olive oil still gives you 100 calories. So that's a lot of calories and about 14 grams of fat. So that's why, you know, some of my patients might say to me, yeah, but I'm eating the good fat. Yeah, but you're having too much of the good fat. And if the majority of your calories is coming from all this fat, it's still fat. So you still have to kind of keep it controlled. I really love those atomizer sprays. You know, you can buy them in, in those home shops where you can actually fill it yourself and put your um, own oil in there. So it's like you're creating your own Pam spray, or you can buy Pam spray, um, olive oil. And it looks like you're putting a lot in the pan or a lot on your salad and you're really not. Okay. So it kind of tricks the brain a little bit. And that's really a great way to control the portion. 
All right, turmeric. I know a lot of people take turmeric. Um, you're taking it in a supplement form. I prefer that you eat it, um, but a lot of people might not like the taste of it. It's very astringent, especially when you get the root of it. It almost looks like a ginger root and it's really pretty because it's orange, but it's very, it's astringent. That's the best way for me to describe it. If you like ethnic foods like Moroccan and Indian and Lebanese, they use a lot of turmeric and curries and things like that. Um, so so I'd rather you eat it. Um, but the curcumin is the phytonutrient that's found in the turmeric. That's, that's what is conferring that health. But you have to activate it. So that's why it's always great to make sure that you have kind of black pepper to activate the turmeric. And that's why if you do a supplement, just make sure it has um, something called piperine. That's the chemical that activates that curcumin. Otherwise, you know, yeah, eat, you're having it, but you're really not reaping the benefit of it. But um, I really like a lot of the Mediterranean foods and the you know curries and things like that. So I, I prefer to eat it. Now, berberine, um, I see this a lot in a supplement. The problem with berberine is I just don't know what dosage would be the safe dosage. And that's why some of these herbals, you have to be careful. So if you were going to go to, you know, the vitamin shop and buy this as a supplement, but you're on other medications, you have to really make sure it's not counterintuitive or counteractive of your other medications. So always ask that. Um, it's not something that, you know, this looks like a pretty berry, but honestly, I never see this sold in the stores. So it's not something that I'm typically familiar with, but I wanted to show it to you anyway. What's nice is that this has been shown to activate the autophagy. The problem is I just wouldn't know what dosage to tell you to take. All right, so if you decided, you know what, this sounds like a pretty cool eating pattern. It sounds like there could be some benefits of intermittent fasting. You know, I'm pre-diabetic or I have a hard time controlling my diabetes or I want to prevent all that and, you know, eat less calories. You know, maybe you want to lose some weight. I think the first thing you have to think about is, well, which eating pattern are you going to follow? Are you going to follow a 16-8? Are you going to do a modified fast? So here's just an example. Just say you decided, okay, I'm going to just eat from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. And I'm going to allow 14 hours of fasting. And what I like about this kind of, you know, eating pattern is that as a nutritionist, what I find is a lot of my patients that are trying to lose weight, they, they don't lose weight or they gain weight because they're snacking. So it's really a controversial issue because you have some nutritionists that say, eat several small meals a day. Um, and that's supposed to make your insulin levels steady. And then you've got this whole other school of thought like this that says, stop snacking, just eat within a certain amount of period and then cut yourself off. And I got to tell you, for a lot of my patients, when I say, okay, cut yourself off, don't have those snacks at bedtime, they actually lose weight. So is it conferring less calories? Yes, it definitely is. Is it changing the eating pattern? Yes. So if you're eating from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., you're allowing 14 hours of fasting. This is just an example. Maybe you might want to start out with a smoothie or a yogurt or a protein shake. And then maybe for lunch, you're having some sort of Mediterranean diet. So you're doing maybe a grass-fed organic beef burger and you're having a side salad. And then for dinner, you're having some broiled salmon, brown rice, and steamed broccoli. So when you look at the menu, yeah, it's, it's, you're not having a lot of snacks. So when you look at this kind of calorie, depends on how much you're actually doing. So let's see, just say the green smoothie, you're doing 12 ounces and your beef burger is about three ounces and you're having a side salad, maybe putting a little olive oil on there. And then broiled salmon, you're doing three to four ounces. Brown rice, you're doing half a cup. Steamed broccoli, you're doing a cup. So this kind of diet could be 1200 calories or less. So you might look at it and say, okay, I'm going to be starving on this, but that's the unique thing about intermittent fasting. It kind of takes away that hunger a little bit. So you really won't be starving. At least I hope not, but this could be a nice menu to start off with. So here's um, another example. You might want to eat between the hours of 12 p.m. and 6 p.m. because you're not a breakfast person. You know, yeah, you sleep late. All right, I'm going to start at 12 p.m. So 12 p.m. and to 6 p.m. 
Make sure you hydrate, of course, and you can kind of still do the same kind of foods. You just move it around a little bit. So instead of doing the smoothie, maybe I'm having the burger for lunch. And then later on as a, as a snack, I'll do the smoothie or the protein shake. And then for dinner, I'm going to have my salmon. So you can kind of just move things around a little bit. Now, this was actually my menu. This is what I did for my two day 400 to 700 calorie diet. I did a 700 calorie on this day. So for breakfast, I had two egg whites with half a cup of spinach. I used it with a little Pam spray so it wouldn't stick. I had some black coffee, actually I had tea. I can't drink black coffee, so I had some black tea. Um, and then lunch, I had some three ounces of grilled chicken breast with a salad. I used one tablespoon of balsamic vinegar. And then for dinner, I had a three ounce filet mignon on this particular day and I had a cup of broccoli. So when you look at it, it almost looks like, uh, I wouldn't call it a keto diet, but maybe almost like a paleo diet. You know, it's pretty low carb and it was about 700 calories. I only did it for two days, but not consecutive days because I wanted to confuse my body a little bit. One thing you have to be careful about is on days that you're not following the 700 calorie diet, that you're not overly splurging, okay? Because that can happen sometimes, right? The next day, oh, yay, I'm not following the 700 calorie diet. Now I'm like, I want more. So this, I was able to follow this. I wasn't hungry at all. Um, I had some good proteins. I had my vegetables. So this worked for me. So definitely some important concepts um, while fasting. Just remember to hydrate. Please remember that. And I, and I keep stressing that just because most of us dehydrate. <laughs> so be careful. You got to start slow. You know, stop if you don't feel energetic. If you've started some sort of eating pattern and you're not feeling good, you got to stop it. OK, because maybe it's just not working or it's just not working for your particular physiology. If you do continue to exercise, use common sense. Like on those 700 calorie days, I was not cycling 50 miles. I, I, I just I wasn't doing it. You know, I wouldn't be able to do it. I totally bonk out after five miles. So maybe I'm just doing a 10 mile ride on that day. So you do have to adjust your physical activity to your calorie needs. And track your weight, but more importantly, track your body composition. I know we had this conversation before. I really try not to get caught up on the scale number. You know, I might be 150 pounds, but if I could be, you know, 30% body fat, great. That's normal for me, for my age. Um, so that's really my target. My target is to try to get my body fat below or keep it within normal. So I wanted to just show you this true case of mine. Um, it was a pretty neat case. He did so well. So he's at the time that I saw him, he was 49 years old, pretty tall, six foot tall. He weighed 400 pounds. His body mass index was 54. So that actually categorizes as somebody that's super obese. He wasn't on any medication. He didn't have any issue with his diabetes or his blood pressure, but he was having something called sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is pretty dangerous too. It means you basically stop breathing periodically during the night when you're sleeping. And, you know, sometimes you think, oh my gosh, I have to keep getting up and peeing. Well, guess what? It's not because you got to pee. It's because your body's waking you up to protect you so you don't suffocate and die. So he was getting up several times in the night going to pee. Um, his lowest adult weight was 200 pounds. Um, and his biggest weight loss was about 60 pounds, but he always regained it. Um, he didn't really have any consistent exercise. He, he's um, an attorney, so he has a very busy caseload. Actually, he owned the law practice, so he was extremely busy. He doesn't smoke. Um, he has a family. His family was very supportive. So this is just showing you, actually, he started out at 407. So what we did was when I first saw him, he, I just put him on a calorie-restricted diet. You know, I did what any dietitian would do. All right, let's just cut your calories. So we did that and he gained weight. <laughs> so that totally didn't work for him. It was so sad, right? Um, I did get him into some physical activity. He liked to walk his dog. He would get up early in the morning. So we kind of started to do that. Um, and then he said, look, I want to start intermittent fasting. Okay, so about a month later, we started him on the 5-2. In other words, the two days where we went very low calorie. 
And he also started the elliptical and he was doing so great. I mean, look at his weight loss. He went from 407, 396. And then when he started the intermittent fasting, he dropped to 379 and then 361 and then 339. And then what happened was he was getting kind of bored of this intermittent fasting and said, oh, I don't know if that's working for me anymore. So we just went to a calorie restricted diet. And he was still losing weight, still losing weight, still losing weight, still losing weight. So he was doing really great, 407, 285. We started looking at his body composition. I couldn't do it earlier just because, um, believe it or not, the scale that I had didn't have the capacity for somebody at his weight. So I had to wait until he got below 300. And we were able to look at his, his body mass index and his fat mass and all that. So that was really great got down to 274, 271, 266, 261. So look how great he did. I got, I got this gentleman down from 407 pounds to 249 pounds without any surgery. So this was a combination between calorie restriction, intermittent fasting, increasing exercise, changing him basically into a Mediterranean diet. So while he was eating, he was eating Mediterranean foods and he was doing really, really great. He was even exploring yoga. So he was doing different types of activities now that was that started when, when did I first see him back in 2017 and 2018 did really great in 2019 um, this is when he actually relapsed a little bit he had a drink which he didn't typically drink but um, family members were putting a lot of pressure on him actually to drink and he caved and he had a little bit of vodka and unfortunately that spiraled him and then he, at the same time, he was decreasing his swimming and then he got cravings and he ate a whole bag of candy, you know? And then what happened was he was embarrassed, so we didn't come back. And so that's why I put loss to follow up. But what was really interesting is just maybe about two months ago, he called. I was so excited that he called and I was able to see how he was doing. He actually um, got back up to about 274. So he's back up to 274, but imagine he was over 400 pounds. So he's still done, done very, very well. So um, we reestablished our relationship and we kind of started him over and getting him back on track again. And he wanted to restart that intermittent fasting. And then with all that information I, I understood about autophagy, um, we put him on intermittent fasting, but we decided to do instead of the 5-2, we did a 16-8. And he's been following that and he's been doing pretty well. His sleep apnea is gone. He, we did his lab tests. His labs are perfect. His blood pressure is perfect. So he's doing really, really, really great. So I think really the take home message of intermittent fasting and autophagy is that eating less calories is healthful. And if you wanted to really start this, try to figure out how many calories you eat in the first place. So before making any changes, maybe get onto MyFitnessPal, start tracking what you eat and do it for at least a week before you make any changes because you wanna see what is your trend. Maybe one day you're eating 1200 calories, maybe the next day you're eating 400 calories. So you're actually essentially doing a modified fast or maybe your calorie level is just too high. And depending upon what your goal is, if you need to lose weight or you need to gain weight, we have to change around the, the calorie level, but keep it relatively low, almost below your needs. And that's what actually will induce that autophagy. An eating pattern that helps us decrease calories is intermittent fasting. Just make sure you're eating the nutritious foods during your feeding times because there are so many different diets that we can follow. The basis of a healthy diet, as we all know, are lean proteins, lean or low fat dairy. Um, lots of vegetables go crazy with vegetables because they're very low calorie, they're very low sugar. And then fruit is good too, just you still have to monitor fruit, maybe two or three servings per day. Legumes, if you like legumes, those are always really good for us, and um, even with blood pressure issues. And it is a form of a plant protein. Um, and definitely start going slow. Whenever you change an eating pattern or start a new diet, you got to go slow and assess how you feel. And then you make adjustments as you go along. OK, 
okay? Because remember, one diet doesn't fit all. You have to kind of fit what works with you. Like I follow modified fast, but not all the time. That's not my general eating pattern. I'll do that at certain times of the year or certain times when I feel like I need to you know, slim down a little bit or if I feel like my body fat went up or what have you. So you kind of play around with your eating pattern and the foods you eat. All right, so I know that was really a big mouthful, but what questions might you have about 